two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the self-publishing formula. Yes, it's James and Mark and a special nighttime edition. Hello to all you truckers out there. It's like it's like <laughs> love radio. I don't know what to say to that, James. But, um, yes, I see you've got your uh, your your pink lights on. I've got my pink lights on. The more are they pink or purple? They are sort of pink. Lilac. The color scheme. It, the color scheme is called Pink Floyd. So that's a bit of a giveaway. Um, and uh, we've had some technicals today, which is why Mark is very blocky. You look like a nineteen eighties Nintendo GameCube game. But that's okay. It's quite retro. It's quite. You're so cool. I'm very cool. So zeitgeist. Yeah, it's been the smoothest podcast ever because we've done it three times now. So this. Uh, yeah. Yes, we have got a. I'll take over. We <laughs> we've got a packed episode. I know what you're going to say James because you said it twice yeah. already. Um, um, <laughs> yes, it's going to be a packed episode. We we think this could be quite popular with uh, listeners because we're going to look at the uh, the one thing that I um, actually say the one thing. There's the several one things that I would have wished that I'd known when I started self publishing six years ago. So um, looking forward to, to jumping into some of those because we I think sometimes people need to just kind of uh, take a step back and just think about um, the things that the important things, the essential things that need to be got right before you launch into some of the other things that, w- that we deal with advertising and marketing, and all that kind of stuff is getting the platform right. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's the one thing for multiple people. Um, and uh, it's a really good episode. And I've, I was saying to Mark earlier that I know that this will be one of those spike episodes on our downloads. It's the one people will be gravitate to, but it's really useful, full of value. However, uh, before we get going, uh, I just want to get some housekeeping out of the way. So for podcast regulars, we've had a couple of competitions running. You remember that Dave Chesson came onto the podcast uh he is the author of the KDP Rocket uh, software, which is a idea validation software. We ran a contest. The K, uh, Dave very kindly donated three licenses, and they have been won. So we've done the electronic draw. They've been won by Adriana Descalou, uh, Terry Miles. I think it's Terry Miles. I sort of deduced his name from his email address, and Camilla Allen. So well done to Adriana, Terry, and Camilla. They've got their licenses and get, are getting going with that. And thank you to everybody else who took part. You've got one week left on the Pat Mills competition. So you might remember Pat Mills, the creator of 2000 AD and Judge Dredd, uh, is giving away a signed copy of his paperback, uh, which is called Serial Killer. And in addition to that, you get a signed 2000 AD script. I think you even get to choose which one it is. Um, So one week left on that. And the URL for that is selfpublishingformula.com forward slash Pat Mills. Uh, And we're going to have another important URL to give you uh, in a moment because we've put together a really good, useful handout uh, for today's episode. And as a special bonus for that handout, one person who downloads it will be offered a free enrollment in our 101 course. And the reason we can say that is because, Mark, we are seven days away, aren't we? We are seven days away, yes. We we go live um, Friday the... 7th is that right Friday the 7th no that's not right 2nd um, of Second, June yeah. at 10 p.m. yeah 10 p.m. UK time so um, we're, we're kind of running around like crazy and I'm getting everything ready for that um, we had the last launch was fantastic we had uh, 1200 students I think um, enroll last time and um, slightly we underestimated how popular the course was going to be so we're ready this time we are girding our loins or at least uh, you and me are uh, James John I'm not sure what John's doing he's probably relaxing <laughs> He's drunk now. Um, Mind you, I'm drinking beer because it's a nighttime podcast, so it's beer time. <laughs> yes, um, but yeah, we're ready. We're ready to go. So definitely looking forward to getting getting the doors open. So people will start to get emails um, towards the middle of next week, telling people what what they can get in the course um, and um, cost and bonuses and all that kind of good stuff. Yep. So Mark Dawson's self publishing one hundred and one course doors open Friday, June the second, ten p.m. UK, which is five p.m. in New York. 3 p.m., 3, 4, 5, yeah, 3 p.m. on the West Coast, I think. Move away, James, move away. Yeah, other time zones are available, um, so I can't <laughs> from the top of my head do Australia and the Far East, but um, Google will give you the answers to that. And um, mm. we'll be open. We did take on 1,200, which is right, above, I mean, that was, we kept it open 
because people were still interested beyond where we perhaps should have done. Um, it's been a very busy time for us, which is fine, but we won't keep it open probably for that same period of time. So we'll um, June the 2nd, we'll onboard not quite as many this time. Uh, but I can tell you, because I've been doing the testimonial interviews, I did one this afternoon um, in Quebec, Nadine in Quebec, Nadine Travers, and I spoke to uh, David yesterday in LA. David has a cool job. Now, as I meant to mention him to you, Mark. We might get him on as a guest in the future as a podcast. He cuts the trailers for Fox. It's his job. Ooh. So... So he cuts Simpsons trailers, and I talked to him about Futurama. It's one of my big, uh, my favourite shows, Futurama, when Fox had it. <laughs> um, and he'll cut some film trailers, trailers, some TV episodes. And it was I talked to him a bit about whether you do you watch like, the whole episode, or just a little bit of it. He said, no, we always watch the whole thing, which isn't necessarily complete at that stage, um, before they work out what the narrative is and how the trailer's going to work. And turning that that into a 10 second 20 second tv spots quite an art form so i thought in terms of story and approach mm. to story would be an interesting conversation really interesting guy anyway dave is one of many people i've spoken to recently who took the one-on-one -on -one course and have absolutely loved it and have said it was what they needed in terms of finding their way through the bit of jungle that uh, that faces you when you first start self-publishing so um mm -hmm. we've been really pleased with one-on-one course and uh, i think it's going to go well next friday okay enough of a plug for the one-on-one course let's move on to our topic today so it's called The One Thing, and the URL you're going to need to download the PDF and enter the contest for a free spot on 101 is selfpublishingformula.com forward slash The One Thing. One is spelt rather than the digit, O-N-E, all one word. And what we did, we went out uh, far and wide and asked people who are down the line with uh, self-publishing, we asked them... Uh, what was that one thing that when they look back with hindsight and thought, do you know, if I'd known that, life would have been easier. So let's get that out to people like me who are at the beginning of our careers. And Mark, how are we going to start this? I know we've partitioned the answers, haven't we, into various groups? A little bit, yeah. So, I mean, the, the idea I had was um, to ask the question and the, the answers that we're going to go through are things that I think are important and things I would have liked to have known as, as the one, some of the important things I wish I'd known when I got started. So um, the first one I'd say um, is is to not consider or, or to consider all forms of publication. So um, don't dismiss self-publishing. So we, we still see that quite a lot. Um, and um, I was interviewed by The Guardian, uh, so a fairly big UK newspaper last week. And it got lots of traction, and uh, the comments were very busy. I uh, kind of uh, braved uh, to, to braved it to go down below the line and start to answer some of those those comments. And something that was uh, that came out more than once was uh, people who profess themselves to be writers saying they wouldn't consider self publishing um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I think some people still think it's vanity. Others uh, don't realise what's available financially and otherwise. And um, I was like that when I started out um, after being traditionally published at the, at the turn of the millennium. I, um, I wrote another book and even though I knew that self-publishing was interesting and even though it was kind of the impetus that got me back to writing again, my um, initial um, impetus was to take um, was to go to my agent and ask her to ship it around the traditional publishers in London. Um, and I think I did that because I was still misguided because I thought that was that was the prestige form of publication um, and this was so this was seven or eight years ago so times were a little bit different then and, and things have changed since but um, there are still plenty of authors uh, like I was and as I saw in the comments to that Guardian article who will just dismiss self-publishing as as a, a second best way of, of getting their stories out there and what I would say, I think this is probably the most important thing, and I know I'm preaching to the choir because most of our most of our audience will be um, self-publishing or thinking about it, is is just to remember that um, the story is the most important thing, and the means of distribution, so the mechanism you use to get your story into the hands of readers, is kind of largely irrelevant. Um, and when you think about it that way, and then when you start to look at the financial benefits of of self-publishing and uh, the, the freedom and the independence and the, the kind of being responsible for everything, which of course is a blessing and a curse. Uh, but when you start to take all those things on board, it becomes much more, 
it's an easier decision, I think, to consider um, doing it yourself rather than relying on uh, on gatekeepers. That 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 model is is dying out now, or changing. Yeah, the way. yeah. And I, I I interviewed um, an author called Susie K. Quinn yesterday, who lives quite nearby, actually, here in the UK, and has written um, a very successful novel that's doing well in the. In fact, it was in the top ten of Amazon a couple of days ago. Uh, her third novel she's got another one coming out and she did a pretty decent deal it's a really great interview and I don't want to give too much of it away now uh, but she goes into the figures a bit like you've done in the past Mark she said how much she made from her first traditional deal and then how much that she was offered for her second book by which point she had this one eye now on self-publishing and for her it was a natural draw she sort of wanted the she already ha had arguments with them about the cover they chose for her book she didn't think worked and she was despondent about the lack of marketing that, that she saw behind the book and she didn't feel inspired really to to sign that deal again and then now she's gone down the self-publishing route and she was crystal clear about it in terms of the figures which she gives out in the interview but she basically says when she signed that initial deal she was writing a book 75 percent of which was paying for a building in london and now that 75 percent is paying for her house and now that that is a no-brainer right yeah, I think when you start looking at it in, in that way, it does make sense. And I, I, I mean, I got decent advances when I started out. Um, but, you know, I, I made, when I released my last Milton book, within the first month, I'd made the advance I, for two traditionally published books. So it's, it's for me, it is a, it's a bit of a no-brainer now. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much wedded to, to doing this myself. And, you know, it's, it's not to say that going traditional is is not for is something that no one should consider because it's quite clear that some authors um are better suited for that um literary fiction is probably um still better served by traditional publishing not necessarily completely but i think there's some advantages there and also most importantly if you are not interested in doing you know becoming the the, the publisher um so being in charge of marketing covers uh, sourcing editors all that kind of uh, background stuff that's incredibly important if that's not um, of any interest to you or you just don't think you've got the skill for it or the patience then there is something to be said um, for going traditional but the, the one thing to take away from that is it's going to cost you 90% of any everything that you make probably once the advance has been earned out because that is going to be the royalty that, that the traditional publisher gives you so when you think about it in that in that sense yeah, I think it's I think it's well you know as i say for me um self publishing is is the is the most interesting uh, way of doing things these days but others others may have different views yeah we'll move on in a moment just the last point i want to make about this is i know well first of all i realize that some of the audience including me are excluded from this uh, at this point because we're not going to be hodder at uh, uh, bloomsbury or whatever not going to be breathing down our necks offering us deals um so this isn't a choice but it is a choice for some people and i know one thing that people think is I can't do self-publishing because it's too complicated and I'm not good with computers what well, I would just say to you look at some of the people who we've uh, interviewed and put forward who've taken our course people like Andrea Domansky Andrea's doing really well uh, Riley Edgewood is another one um, who have really found their way in self-publishing okay they've used Mark's course this is not an advert for your course what the point I'm making is that they are I mean, Andrew in particular would tell you that she is a technophobe in, in every way. I think it's the word she used to me. And yet when you start to work some of this stuff out, she can achieve it. And of course you can. It's like all of us will look at something to start off with and think we can't climb that mountain. And then you start at the bottom, you do bits and pieces, and suddenly you quite enjoy it and you're doing well at it. So don't rule out self-publishing um, on that ground, at least until you've properly looked into it and... Uh, and you might even, we've got a few husband-wife teams, haven't we, where one of them writes and the other one does the marketing. That might work for you as well. Okay, so that is the trad thing, uh, trad versus uh, self-publishing. And it's a slightly mixed advice, as you say. I think foreign rights, you'll still would say, is a, a good, good traditional route for you. But self-publishing, mm -hmm. terms of a commercial return, of kind of quitting your nine-to-five, self-publishing at the moment is an exciting opportunity. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll move on to the next thing um, now. So this we could deal with quite briefly because uh, we've we've dealt with it ad infinitum. So it is that readers don't come to you. You have to go to your readers. Um, and it's the best way to do that is to implement a mailing list straight away um, and then to work on the rest of your platform. So have a Facebook page, have a website, get, you know, get Twitter sorted out. 
whatever your social media channels are going to be, you need to work on those. Um, and I, I spun my wheels for a good six months because I didn't um, start um, doing this properly, which is ironic given that it's probably the thing that I'm best known for now in the main in this building and, and the managing the relationship between um, fans and, and writer. So there's no excuse. Um, I won't go into it in too much detail now because we've already done three episodes on um, kind of mailing list 101, which um, I think it's in the 41, 42 and 43 possibly, but we can pop those um, those references in the show notes just so people can go back and, and look at that. But it is, it's, it's very important. So I'll skip over that quickly. Uh, the next thing is a kind of a craft thing. Um, so it's very important um, to know how to write in a fashion that is on, on the one hand enjoyable for you and on the other hand uh, likely to be attractive to a decent number of readers. So this is a is a, a theory that is called writing to market. It's been um, uh, propagated by a writer called Chris Fox who we should probably get on the show. It's not a new thing but Chris has done lots of work to, to show how it can be effective. And um, we've again we've talked about this before, but it, it is it's if you think about um, two circles, on the one hand is what you you like and you like writing, and the other hand is what readers want, and you need to find that spot where the two circles intersect. And in that kind of cross section, that is your sweet spot. So it might be that um, as as Chris Chris writes kind of military sci-fi, he obviously likes writing that, and his readers like buying it and reading it. So that's 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 the spot that he's hit. And one of the things that I did when I started out was I wanted to write um, a, a 1940s um, James L. Roy style noir thriller set in London during the Blitz. I had this idea. This was this was going to be my thing. And I wrote it. It took me 18 months to two years maybe to, to write the book, which is kind of glacial by the pace that I write these days. Um, Seems quite and- quick to me. <laughs> quick, yeah, quick for you maybe. It's a pretty slow for me. <laughs> um, and so I, I, you know, I, I wrote the book. Um, I'm quite proud of it. I think it's one of my better books, even though it was one of the early ones. But it doesn't sell a tenth of of my uh, the amount that my Milton and my Rhodes books sell. So the lesson I learned from that was I needed to shift a bit. So it isn't necessarily about just writing what I wanted to write. It's something about writing in that sweet spot. And as soon as I I, I moved on to the Milton series, it, it has lots of things that I love. Um, so kind of. Uh, the kind of the uh, tortured hero um, harking back to things like the equalizer and things like that and that the kind of the uh, the overlap was with people like Jack Reacher, David Baldacci, Alex Cross, James Patterson's character. I knew there was a market there for a character like Milton. Um, I also really enjoyed writing him and that's one of the reasons why you know we talk about pace that's one of the reasons why it's not taking me two years to write anymore because I love writing these books they're, they're not massive in terms of uh, detailed research and going to um, Collingdale the newspaper archive and, and researching stuff and I'm also getting great feedback from readers both in terms of reviews and sales um, and then uh, you know, royalties or, or money coming back from Amazon it's that real conflation of um, motivations that just mean I can I, I write more quickly um, and it wouldn't be like that if I decided to, to, to continue writing that 1940 series it's just it isn't even though I enjoy it um, I wouldn't be selling as much I wouldn't be getting that kind of feedback and, and probably if I was still writing that we, we might not be having this podcast because it's quite unlikely that I'd, I'd be doing as well as, I, as I've done um, and and no one would have heard of me so um, you know moving into that that space has been great on a number of different levels for me yeah, I mean, that's really good insight, Mark. And I think some people might look at your Milton books and Beatrix Rose and think they're the books you were kind of born to write and it was natural and it was a coincidence they happened to be commercial. But, at, you know, there was, although it's close, it's, it aligns with what you like doing, but it's, it was still a conscious decision of you, a commercial decision of you to move into those um, and move away from ultimately what's pleasurable but perhaps self-indulgent when it comes to money-making with the, uh, mm. the Soho Noir. Although I did read that book, it's very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I get good reviews for it, but it's, it's never going to sell as much. I, often, I, I occasionally get um, readers emailing saying that when are you going to continue that, that story? And I, and I have to be honest to say that no plans in the immediate future. One day maybe, but um, you know, I, I'm having too much fun writing Milton and Rose books at the moment, so it's, that's on the back burner. 
Okay, so the next thing, um, the we've had heard this from a number of um, writers. In fact, Joanna Penn put this in into the Facebook group when we discussed this episode, and and I agree with her hundred percent. And it, it's that you only really find your voice after several books. So that's not to say that your first book is going to be one that that you should never publish. But what it does mean is that you're only going to be confident in your voice once you've got a few hundred thousand words probably behind you. So from my own personal perspective, when I started writing 97, 98, um, I was very, very keen to um, emulate writers like Martin Amis, uh, Brayson Ellis, Jay McInerney, um, Will Self, people like that. I I wanted to be a pro stylist. I wanted to be um, going to a you know wearing a tuxedo at the booker prize awards and and hearing my name called now that is it's ludicrous on a number of different fronts it's i'm not any of those writers Um, i'm trying to force myself into their style just comes across as a really bad pastiche um and winning the booker prize is is not really you know i think it's 50 grand is it i think you you can win on the on the odds of long that you're gonna you're gonna win something like that um, even if you do, it's not exactly life-changing money. Um, I would much rather be entertaining um, uh, readers now and, and making a decent living, living doing it. And the only way I can do that is to be myself um, and to write my kind of stories, tell them the way that I tell them in my distinctive voice, which I'm now you know, very confident in. I've, I've got you know, over 25 novels published now, so if I'm not confident now in the way that I write my books, well, frankly, I'm never going to be confident. But the the kind of the takeaway from this is that I don't want people to feel discouraged um, after the first couple of books because they still feel that they lack confidence. They still feel that their writing um, doesn't uh, can't be compared with other writers writing in in their genres because that isn't true. Um, you're a bad judge of your books in any event, but you do need that practice. You need to work on um, your craft. And that's something that that does come with with getting your sitting down every day, writing a few hundred or a few thousand words, and then just repeating that um, again and again. And then you know eventually um, you'll you'll be confident in your voice and you'll be ready ready to go. Yeah, I mean it, it is a slightly depressing thing to hear um, that it takes as long as that to to sort of find your voice and get into your swing of things. And actually, we have another. One thing I wish I'd known coming up, which correlates with this a little bit about at the point at which you just publish rather than uh, refine. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it needs to be said. And nobody is going to start any... I mean, this is a craft that's alongside carpentry or sculpture or something. Without being too lordy about it, you don't turn into Rodan on day one. It stands to reason you spend an apprenticeship so why would you be able to write your first book as a great novel? Obviously, there are outliers in the world, but for the vast majority of us, there's an, there is an apprenticeship, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I my my uh, my first books, my first traditionally published books, are dreadful. So um, you know, I don't really know how they got published, to be honest. But you know, the the, the books I write now, I'm quite proud of. So you know, that's that's just practice and and confidence, which which comes with time. So apart, let's do that. Apart next. from having an airliner, mm. so I was going to say, apart from having an airliner at thirty-one thousand feet, five minutes from landing in Las Vegas, I quite like the art of falling down, which is, I think, your first book, isn't it? It's the art of falling apart. Yep, art of falling um, apart. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the art of falling down. That was a good book. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know who wrote that, but yeah, no, the art um, of falling apart. Yeah, yes, I mean, it's right. a book. No, you, could, you could. It's a. It was a. I felt it was a vicarious. Um, Mark Dawson book and there's some other Mark Dawson somewhere who grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, joined a rock band and murdered somebody <laughs> um, I could sense that coming out from within you but uh, anyway I've given no away comment. the plot <laughs> okay um, <laughs> yes, good no, stuff, no so is that that first section, um, I'm not sure what we called the first section um, done? Yes it, it is Yeah, those are kind of foundational things Now, the, the, the next thing is kind of, these are very very loose headlines, not not really to be not to pay too much attention to them but um, the next one is, is kind of mindset so um, the way we think about being an author and I'll, I'll do the you, you kind of hinted to it so I'll just do this one first, so um, it is um, kind of related to a Seth Godin quote so um, my wife Lucy loves Seth Godin and this is one of uh, one of my favorite quotes from him and it is that done is better than perfect 
Um, there's a variation on that, that perfection is the enemy of something. Or <laughs> I can't remember the rest of it. But the, the gist of it is, um, if, you, if, you st- if you stop waiting, if you, if you insist on making your book perfect, so if you revise and revise and revise, um, eventually um, you'll edit the soul out of the book. And also, the more, the more time you spend revising something, your changes will become smaller and smaller. And the effect that they have on how good the book is will also end up being smaller and smaller and smaller Um, to the extent that as you keep as you keep doing stuff you'll you'll literally be moving punctuation around and at that point that is if if you needed a sign that is a sign that you need to um, stop prevaricating and and you know get it published get it out there so you know perfection you should aim to be you, you should aim for aim for perfection but also know that it's almost un- it's almost completely unattainable. You need to know when it is good enough to go, um, and then when you're confident that you've got it there and you can validate that with an advanced team, with um, uh, beta readers, whatever you like. But when you're you're confident enough that it's ready, it's good enough to go, then that is your signal to uh, upload it to the retail platforms and hit publish, and and away you go. Yeah, and I think this uh, plays into one or two of the other tips we're going to come on to in a moment about author mindset of that nagging self-doubt that people have, um, which is a big hurdle when it comes to your very first book. And I know that because I'm there now in releasing it, letting somebody else read it and so on. Um, But there's good advice from people who've been there and done it. Get it out there. Move on to the next one. I mean, the great thing also we should mention in this day and age is you can revise books. And, uh, mm-hmm. and and re-upload them, and people do that all the time. So it's not the end of the world. It's not like in the old days where this massive print run went ahead. Um, uh, in this day and age, you could change something seven days later if you think that there's, there's errors in it. But, um, yeah, you should strive for it being professional, but ultimately a book unpublished is no good, regardless of how good you think it is. Yeah, the next thing um, to avoid is comparisonitis. So it is very easy um, in this day and age to um, look at where you are in your career and to try and compare yourself to where someone else is. And it's it's not it's not healthy to do that. It's not helpful. Um, and you're also not comparing apples with apples. So it it would be easy for me um, five years ago to look at someone longer than that, seven years ago, to look at someone like Hugh Howey, um, who had just broken out with wool. Um, and to think, you know, God, I wish it's so unfair. You know, he's he's just come out of nowhere, and look what's happened. He's he's you know, he's sold his film rights. He's got deals around the world, all of that kind of stuff. But the, what you don't necessarily notice, unless you know Hugh's story, is that um, he worked very hard on six, seven, eight novels before Wool became a, a popular a book. So it wasn't as if he just came out of nowhere. So just just to compare yourself as a new writer with with that. Uh, would would be unhelpful um and generally that kind of comparison is, is just not a helpful thing the, the most important thing i think is to is to concentrate on your own books to concentrate on your own platform your own mailing list um how you you know you're building your career the foundations that you're laying down do your thing um by all means take inspiration from others um you know you could look at um i, I do this all the time looking at successful romance writers for example people like bella andre marie force um, Barbara Freefe, the writers that we've had on the podcast, I will often look at um, things that they've done. Bella Forrest is another good example. Bella writes really fast uh, kind of urban fantasy books and I'm on her mailing list because I want to see what she does because I'm fairly sure there's some things I can learn from her. And, you know, lo and behold, um, there, there have been some things that I've seen that I've started to use and I've started to see some success with as well. So by all means, um, kind of emulate, look at how, how other people are doing things and then try and take those ideas for yourself, make them better, use them in your own way. But um, to become depressed by looking at how many books Bella Forest sells or Barbara Freethy sells, that's not going to get you anywhere. It's just another reason that you're going to um, not publish. You're not going to be enthused to write. You need to insulate yourself from that kind of negative thinking and just you know, do your own thing. Yeah, and I think it's something we come back to occasionally on the podcast is that um, it's not magic what makes people successful. It's it's that type of attitude that you're going to plan and look at how things work and, and make mistakes and get over that and move on. And there are people who will, who will say exactly what you just said, Mark. They'll look at you, actually, and they'll say, well, I could never be. I was lucky for Mark Dawson. If only I was Mark Dawson. 
uh, having that success. It's easy for him to say that about his mailing list. It's easy for him to say that about Facebook advertising. As if you've got magic fairy dust that they haven't got. <laughs> Well, you haven't got that. What you've got is a kind of belligerent attitude that you're going to make it work and a competitive attitude that you want to be successful. Um, and that means that you do stuff. And if it doesn't work, you move it and you shift it and you work out why it's not going to work and you, you do that. So that's obtainable. All of us can obtain that. All of us can do that. Yeah, that's right. It is, um, it's, that's a mindset thing. So you can certainly, if, if people want to take anything away from, from my example, it's just bloody mindedness you know, and determination and motivation. And you know, I will... You know, continue to work hard. I mean, fortunately, I love all of it, but um, um, it didn't fall out of the sky. Um, I had to work very hard to, to sell books. But people can definitely take that away and, and you know look at some of the things that I do. Of course, you know the one on one course lays everything out in terms of the steps that I take um, and and the strategies that I use. You and people are, are you know can certainly learn from that and emulate it just as i'm learning from other authors so yeah but don't um don't let that get you down yeah there's an old quote um attributed to gary player i'm not sure if it is gary player who had a bit of luck on a green and the ball went in and he overheard someone saying that was lucky and he said it's funny the harder i try the luckier i get um, which is <laughs> yeah. the point he was making 30 years of working hard to become a good golfer um yeah it goes your way okay all right. Next? So the last last couple of things. So we, we'll we'll keep this fairly brief now because we're getting up towards the uh, forty five minute mark. Um, and this is just to be prepared to invest in your career. So there are a number of ways that you can do that. You can invest in education. I'm not going to go into that right now because that will very quickly become a sales pitch. I'm not interested in in doing that. But what I would say is there are no. You don't have to spend anything really to, to self-publish. You you need a, a, a word processor or you know writing software, whatever, and and an internet connection. That is enough um, to uh, upload a book which you formatted yourself with something free like the Readsy uh, formatter. You can use Canva to, to put together a, a cover for free, um, and you can get things up there with no financial barriers to entry whatsoever. The caveat that I would say to that is that there are most successful businesses will require some form of capital investment at the start now fortunately for us as writers it doesn't have to be a very significant one I would say the two most important uh, financial investments and these are things actually that I didn't do when I started so this is the one of the one things that I, I wish I'd known when I when I got uh, started with writing is that it's important to invest in a and as good a cover as you can get um, and to invest in either or both if you can afford it, but a good copy editor and or a good proofreader. Certainly a proofreader. If you can afford a copy editor too, that's great. Um, but I think those those two are important. Um, and you know m maybe you know maybe you can't spring for a three hundred um, or four hundred dollar cover. Fair enough. Maybe there's another way that you can uh, you can get um, a cover done. You can use a pre-made cover. So um, Stuart Bass, who's a friend of the podcast. Uh, has a series of uh, free covers or sorry pre-made covers that I think cost around about 150 pounds um, you could um, swap services with um, another author perhaps you know someone who is a talented um, uh, user of Photoshop you could offer to proofread their novel in exchange for them doing a, a cover for you so there's lots of ways you can be creative with, with that kind of thing and the other thing is, is just getting your your, um, your manuscript as clean as possible um, so the, the kind of the reason I say that's important and again I didn't do this when I started was that you should do it even if you really have to push yourself to, to, to do it you, know, you have to stretch your finances to get that in place because first impressions are really really hard to undo um, and the proof of that if you go to my, my first you go to the Black Mile or even go to the first Milton book um, the cleaner the if you look all the way back to the start of those books lives and you look at some of the the reviews there there are more than a few one star reviews that are complaining that the book is full of the books are full of typos and that's absolutely true and obviously i've changed them subsequently as, as you said earlier you can um, you can always re-upload cleaner manuscripts but um, i thought in the early days i could um, proofread those books myself which is one of the stupidest things an author can say because you, you won't you just won't see those errors so I put those up there, and you know maybe I had some promotions in in the, in the um, early days where I had forty or fifty thousand free downloads of the Black Mile over the course of a weekend, and a very good chance that a good number of the the um, readers who um, got those books and started to read them 
would have um, stopped reading because they would have been thrown out of the narrative by the fact that I kept having having typos in the book that I just hadn't seen. So you're not serving yourself at all by um, cutting corners on something like that. It does. Um, it, it, it is something that is worth saving up for so that you can get someone, not who isn't you, a professional with an independent eye, just to look at uh, that uh, manuscript and, and strip out as many errors as, as they can. Just going back to the uh, invest in your career point, and uh, whilst you're absolutely right, there are lots of ways, and this podcast and others' uh, resources will point you in the direction of doing things for zero or very little cost. Just to reiterate, another point that you made there mark is that you have to invest in a business and we always say to people you should look at your publishing career as a business as well as a vocation and and there's no business that doesn't require some help at the beginning and what you don't want people say well i can't i can't afford 300 dollars for this that and the other and i've been at points of that like that in my life i mean i jacked in my first career which was lucrative i was in debt just taken a big mortgage and i took a job because I wanted to work for the BBC, a salary cut in half. I had no, I could not do it. Financially, I could not, I didn't discuss it with my parents because I knew they'd be upset and angry about it and point out to me the bleeding obvious, which is you can't afford to do this, make this decision, but I did it anyway. And I worked hard on the BBC and eventually my salary got up and I recovered myself. And they're, they're scary moments. They are, without question, they're scary moments in your life. But do you know what? What you don't want to do is to be three years down the line, have done things quite badly at the beginning, done your own cover rather than invested in a, in a professional cover, not had your author career get off the ground for the want of what? For the want of $1,000 in one year, spread over a couple Excellent. of years maybe yeah. to get yourself going? Absolutely, yeah. That's It's a false economy to, to try and um, save save that much um, money and you know you spend as you say a lot of time working on something maybe a couple of years writing a novel um, if you don't if you put it up there without some without a cover unfortunately people do judge books by their covers you, you might have, you might have written the most amazing novel and people won't download it because they think that cover cover looks amateur therefore the rest of the book will be, will be amateur it's it's kind of a it's a fairly low barrier to entry but I think that that is one of the, the two things that you really really do need to uh, to get sorted out great okay mark brilliant thank you and i want to say a big thank you to everybody who's contributed with the one thing um i think it'll be an spf book in the future i think it'd be a great book actually um uh because it's got so many people feeding into it with some great tips and we'll flesh out each one with some links so that's something for us to work on in the background uh, in the meantime you have this wonderful pdf which has been put together by lucy uh, mark's wife who's uh, helping out on spf and it looks really good i can tell you uh, you can get it by going to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash the one thing all spelt out with one in the middle and one person who downloads that PDF will get offered a free enrollment into Mark Dawson's Self-Publishing 101 course. Uh, this doesn't apply if you already are in 101, I'm afraid. Uh, there'll be other contests in the future, don't worry. Um, but if you're not enrolled at the moment and you fancy getting it for free, we'll let you know by uh, the beginning of the course uh, if you've got that. And the beginning of that course is June the 2nd. I say the beginning of the course, the opportunity to enrol in it. You can do it in your own time after that. It's not uh, It's not live. It's uh, the video sessions. Um, but that will be open for business on uh, June the 2nd at 10 p.m. UK time. A little bit earlier, most uh, if you go west from here. A little bit later if you go east from the UK. Um, and we look forward to that. Mark, it was good. Good episode. We've had unbelievable technical problems today. I'm hoping that it wasn't too obvious to people. There were large chunks in that podcast where I couldn't hear what you were saying, but we've done it three times now, so I'm, I kind of knew what you were saying. Yes. Yeah. And uh, earlier, James <laughs> James sounded like a Smurf, um, which is, is one of the funniest Mark things I've heard. And, and <laughs> killing yeah, himself we, earlier. Yeah. I was. Uh, but no, we, we got there. So uh, yeah, hope. Hopefully people um, get something useful from that. I think it is use it's useful to think about some of those things. And it's useful for me too to take myself back to how I was seven years ago and just um, refresh my memory that these, these are the important things that we need to get right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, look, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed for listening. We'll speak to you next week. Bye. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. 
You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. We'll be right back.